Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Today we have two speakers presenting in our webinar, Federico Camerlenghi and Lorenzo Masovero. Uh, Federico is a senior assistant professor in the Department of Economics, Management and Statistics at the University of Milano, Bicocca, Italy. His research interests focus on Bayesian non-parametrics, uh, completely random measures, MCMC methods, mixture models, point processes, species sampling problems, survival analysis, and stochastic geometry. We also have a Lorenzo, who is a PhD student at MIT in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. His research interests are in machine learning with emphasis on Bayesian non-parametric models and network data. The, the title of the talk today is Bayesian non-parametric prior for genomic variant discoveries. Uh, Federico and Lorenzo, thank you for accepting our invitation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thanks. Can I start? Yes, okay. yes please. Thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. Uh, this is a joint talk with uh, Lorenzo Masuero, and I'm very happy to share the talk with him, who has been, we started to work together during his PhD studies at uh, MIT. And uh, this uh, talk is based on a joint work with uh, Tamara Brodrick and Stefano Favaro. Um, I will uh, focus in, uh, in this talk, we will focus on Bayesian on parametric priors for uh, genomic variant discoveries. Um, this is the outline of my part of the talk. Uh, I will introduce uh, uh, this uh, set, the setting of the feature sampling models, and I will focus on uh, the importance of uh, these uh, feature sampling models in the context of uh, uh, genomic variant discoveries. Uh, in particular, uh, I will focus uh, on two different uh, choices, two different Bayesian parametric priors for uh, uh, genomic variant discoveries for Bernoulli processes. Uh, the first class of priors that I'm going to, uh, to focus on is the class of completely random measures. And uh, I will develop the distribution theory for completely random measures. And uh, in particular, I will focus on the predictive structure of completely random measure priors. I will show that, uh, um, so uh, after, uh, after showing the predictive rules induced by completely random measures, in order to enrich the predictive structure induced by completely random measures, we introduce a new, a new class of processes, uh, which, are, uh, the which is the class of scaled process priors. Um, in particular, uh, uh, again, uh, we will develop distribution theory for this class of processes, uh, and I will focus on a, a special, a specific uh, uh, choice for these priors, which is the choice of a stable scale process prior. Uh, so the, the class of stable scale process priors, uh, we will show that it uh, turns out to be um, particularly tractable uh, in this context. Uh, at the end of my part, uh, of the, my, at the end of my presentation, uh, I will uh, characterize uh, scale process priors in terms uh, of their predictive structure. Uh, in the second part uh, of, uh, um, by Lorenzo, he will focus uh, especially on uh, an application of uh, this uh, uh, class of processes uh, in the case uh, of uh, uh, genomic uh, in, uh, in genomics. So this is the introduction, and just to introduce, uh, uh, just to introduce uh, uh, the, uh, the, the context, uh, we are, uh, um, I, I would like to focus on the assumption, uh, which is uh, the, the assumption of exchangeability. So what does it mean that a sequence of observations is exchangeable? It means that the order in which the observations are recorded is irrelevant. And exchangeability is a kind of homogeneity across data that allows you to face prediction. Since we are not a magician, so since we, I am not a magician, we have to assume this kind of homogeneity across data in order to face prediction. So, and uh, this uh, is a suitable assumption in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in several frameworks. Uh, thanks to the definitive representation theorem, uh, exchangeability is equivalent to assuming the existence of a random probability measure P the P, conditionally on which uh, the sequence of observations is uh, independent and identically distributed as T the P. And the distribution of T the P is called the definitive measure of the sequence. Uh, 
uh, exchangeability, is, as I said, is a, is a common assumption in uh, several uh, frameworks. Uh, for example, in the context of species and uh, feature sampling models. Uh, so um, I'm now, in order to recall the, the, the setting of species, I, I remember that uh, in the species setting, uh, you typically deal with a population of animals uh, which are composed by different species uh, with unknown proportions. And uh, in uh, the species setting, uh, a suitable class of uh, Bayesian parametric priors uh, has been uh, introduced by Pittman. This is the class of species sampling models. Uh, what is a species sampling model? A species sampling model is nothing but a, ran a random probability measure like this, which is the sum of random jumps at random locations. And the locations here are the species labels, represent the species labels, while the, uh, the random proportions represent, so the random proportion represent the species proportions. And these random proportions, uh, they, they sum up to one. So the class of species sampling models is very general, but this class includes uh, this class includes well-known priors in the literature, uh, for example, the Dirichlet process prior and the pitman York process. The predictive structure of these uh, species sampling models uh, has been widely analyzed in, uh, in, the, in the Bayesian parametric literature, and also uh, m set ahead prediction has been, uh, has been faced in several contexts, uh, starting from uh, the, con the seminal contribution of Lioi and co-authors. Uh, what, what does it mean, m set ahead prediction? It means that you have an initial sample of size n and you would like to predict the outcome of an additional and an observed sample of arbitrary size. So uh, in this framework, in the species setting, each observation is allowed to belong to one and only one species. In the present, uh, in the present talk, I will focus on uh, feature sampling models and feature sampling models generalize uh, the species setting, uh, indeed, uh, in, uh, in the feature setting, uh, you have that uh, each observation uh, is allowed to belong to more than one species, uh, which are now called features. And uh, feature sampling models are uh, uh, very popular, uh, and uh, uh, they can be applied in different frameworks. So, for example, in genomics, uh, to account for uh, uh, the presence or the absence of, 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 or a variant in, of a variant in the human genome, uh, they, uh, they first appeared in ecology to account for the presence or the absence of an animal in a trap. And uh, uh, in, uh, in ecology, an observation is, an, is a trap, and in each trap you can find the animals belonging to different species. Uh, this is the reason why I say that uh, feature sampling models generalize, uh, uh, species, uh, feature sampling models generalize uh, um, species sampling models. So in uh, the context of in the feature setting, uh, we would like to address uh, several issues. First of all, we would like to investigate the predictive structures of different Bayesian parametric priors. Uh, and uh, especially, uh, I will focus on completely random measures and scale process priors, so two different choices. Uh, then uh, we would like to address and step ahead prediction in the, in the context of in the feature setting. What does it mean? So you have this initial sample of size n, and you would like to predict the outcome of a future sample of arbitrary size m. And finally, we would like to emphasize the importance of these, uh, uh, these results in the context of genomics. So uh, our uh, motivating application is, uh, uh, is a genomic application to study uh, the variants in the human genome. And in particular, this. Uh, study of uh, genetic variants is uh, very important, uh, for example, to understand the rare, genetic, uh, rare genetic disease in cancer, in precision, med in precision medicine, and so on. And uh, uh, in, uh, in, in genomics, an observation uh, can be represented as an individual genomic sequence. So the observation is an individual genomic sequence like this. Um, so as you can see, you have this uh, A, C, T, and G, and uh, these are the atomic units of the sequence, which are called base or nucleotide. And uh, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the individual sequence is also divided into different locus positions, and uh, each locus position uniquely identifies a gene. And uh, the specific expression of a gene is called uh, an allele. 
So for example, here you have locus position one and you observe the following allele. Uh, as you can see here, you, you also have another important element, uh, which is uh, the reference genome. Indeed, uh, for any population, you have an, an ideal genomic sequence, which is called uh, the reference genome. And, this is, uh, and uh, the, the reference genome is uh, the following one. So for each locus position, you can compare uh, the, um, the observed allele with respect to the reference allele. And uh, a variant is called when the allele that you observe is different from the reference allele. For example, in this, in this framework, in this, uh, in this individual sequence, uh, we observe a variant at position three and at position five, because uh, as you can see here, this uh, allele is different from the reference allele. Okay, so uh, this is the motivating application. Uh, you can encode the individual sequence in a counting measure like this. So this, uh, uh, this individual sequence may be represented by a counting measure. And uh, uh, what does, it, uh, so in this counting measure, as you can see, you have different elements. Uh, and uh, here you have WI. WI uh, can be seen as the name of of uh, the locus position, and it, this is also called a feature. Uh, and a, a, this, uh, this variable, A and I, is a Bernoulli random variable with, a with, uh, uh, with mean rock on I. And uh, this Bernoulli random variable is equal to one if you observe a variant at position WI. Otherwise, this Bernoulli random variable is equal to zero. Uh, and uh, this uh, so this uh, counting measure identifies uh, the, uh, the genomic sequence that you consider. Um, so <clears throat> all the parameters of this uh, statistical model are encoded in a discrete measure, the following one. So as you can see, this discrete measure is the sum of rho con i, and rho con i is the probability of observed variant at position i, and here wi is the name of the locus position, or uh, also called the feature in general. So uh, to sum up, uh, this is the, the statistical model uh, we are dealing with. Uh, so we are considering Bernoulli processes. Uh, this is a Bernoulli process because these are Bernoulli random variables. Uh, and uh, uh, since uh, uh, we are Bayesian, we have to choose uh, a prior distribution for uh, the parameter of the model. The parameter is an infinite dimensional one because it's a discrete measure. And uh, uh, so there are several questions that we would like to address. First of all, how can we select the distribution tilde mi? So how can we select the distribution of tilde mi? So how can we select Z? What are the predictive rules that we obtain? And uh, finally, how can we predict uh, new genetic variants in a future study, in a future sample of size M? So we would like to address the following issues in this talk. And uh, in, uh, in my part of the talk, I will focus on two different choices for uh, the prior distribution. First of all, uh, I would like to discuss the case of completely random measures, which are well known in the literature, uh, and uh, with a special emphasis on the three-parameter beta process. And then I will move to this uh, new class in this context, which is the class of scaled process prior. And in particular, we, uh, we will focus on the case of a very tractable model, which is the model, uh, the model which assumes uh, a stable beta scaled process prior. Now, uh, I will focus on a completely random measure priors for Bernoulli processes. So just to recall what is a, a completely random measure, uh, so uh, a random measure is, uh, so a random measure is simply a measure which is random, and it's usually characterized by the following Laplace functional, which, has, which is defined in the following way. A random measure is also called completely random if and only if the random variables, the, the mu a1 till the mu a2, K are independent for any choice of disjoint vowel sets, I1 and K, and for any choice of K bigger than one. Uh, so as the most of the current literature, uh, we will focus on completely random measures having both random uh, jumps and random locations. So these uh, completely random measures are characterized by a Laplace functional of the following exponential form. As you can see, the Laplace functional, it this, uh, this Laplace function has an uh, exponential form and it uniquely, it, uh, it uniquely depends on this uh, measure nu, 
which is called the LAV intensity measure of the completely random measure tilde mi. And it uniquely characterizes the distribution of tilde mi. So uh, uh, in order to denote the distribution of such a completely random measure, I will use the following notation uh, here. Uh, and finally, uh, I will focus on uh, homogeneous completely random measure. That is to say, uh, I will assume that the LAV intensity measure factorizes like this. As you can see, this is equivalent to saying that uh, the sequence of jumps and the sequence of atoms here are independent random variables. Uh, so uh, we consider our uh, Bernoulli process model and uh, we assume to work with a completely random measure flywheel. Uh, we have also to consider completely random measures with jumps in zero one, because if you remember the jumps here of the completely random measures so the jumps are the, uh, the parameters of the Bernoulli random variables. A popular, a, po a popular choice in this context is uh, the three-parameter beta process. So the, the three-parameter beta process is a completely random measure having the following level intensity. So the level intensity of uh, the three-parameter beta process is the following one. Uh, this, uh, uh, this completely random measure has been introduced and discussed by Tain Gorur. Uh, so um, we now we analyze the predictive distribution of uh, completely random measures. Uh, so what are the predictive rules induced by this class uh, by this class of processes? So um, we assume to uh, we, assume, we consider a sample uh, Z1 and Z n of size n, and we assume to work with a completely random measure fiber. Uh, we consider, so we assume that uh, um, uh, to observe k distinct features out of the sample with respective counts and one and k. What does it mean? It means that we observe W1 star M1 in M1 observations. We assume that feature WK star has been observed, has been recorded in MK observations. So the predictive rules for uh, general completely random measures and may be derived using a result uh, by uh, Lancel and James. And uh, uh, in particular, it's possible, uh, exploiting the results uh, in uh, James, it's possible to characterize uh, so the predictive distribution, so the distribution of the next individual given the past. And uh, uh, the next individual uh, uh, may select a certain number of new features and a certain number of already observed features in the initial sample. So the number of new features that uh, the individual may select is given by this part in blue. And this part in blue, uh, a posteriori, is, uh, sorry, uh, this part in blue, a posteriori, is again a Bernoulli process. Uh, and the Bernoulli process uh, has a parameter, which is again a completely random measure, as you can see. And uh, the LV intensity of the completely random measure in this context is the following one. So uh, a posteriori, this part in blue is again a Bernoulli process with updated uh, LV intensity the, uh, of, for the completely random measure. And uh, it's important to underline that this, uh, LV, this updated LV intensity depends on the initial sample only to the sample size n and not on other sample statistics. Then you have also this part in green, which refers to the, to the number of already observed features. And in particular, individual, this individual may select, for example, feature WI star with a probability J con I, where J con I has its own distribution. But in this talk, we are interested typically in the number of new genetic variants, in the number of new features. So I want to focus much more on this part in blue which I underline again, that it depends. Uh, so the distribution of this depends on the initial sample only through the sample size. Uh, as a corollary of the previous uh, general theorem, you can also characterize uh, the predictive distribution for, uh, for example, for the three-parameter beta process. And in such a case, uh, you have that the completely random measure of this part in blue, so of the underlying Bernoulli process, is again a, a, a beta process a posteriori. So what are the consequences of uh, this approach? Uh, the posterior distribution 
we can, so if you are interested, for example, in posterior distribution of uh, statistics involving new features, so the posterior distribution of all the statistics involving new features depend on the initial sample only to the sample size then, and not on other sample statistics. So as a result of this um, uh, posterior characterization, we can state that all the, the, if you are interested in posterior distributions of statistics involving the new features not already observed in the initial sample, then the posterior distribution of these statistics is, uh, it depends on the initial sample only to the sample size n. And typically, since uh, you are using a completely random measure prior, you get Poisson posterior distribution. This, uh, this part will be also emphasized by uh, Lorenzo in the second part of the talk. So just to summarize, what are the advantages of the proposed approach? So you, uh, first of all, if you use uh, what are the advantages of the approach based on completely random measure. Uh, if you use a completely random measure, you get closed form expressions for, uh, for, all, the quantity, uh, for all the quantities of interest. Your, uh, your posterior distribution is simple. You get, uh, uh, so, uh, you get interpretability of all the parameters. Uh, you also, uh, you don't, uh, so you, you don't have to resort to uh, complicated uh, MCMC procedures, but uh, your uh, expressions uh, are very simple in close form. Uh, they are scalable to massive data set, but uh, you have also drawbacks uh, with uh, the approach based on completely random measures. First of all, uh, the jumps or conai of the completely random measures are independent across features. So the jumps, so the probability of observing a specific feature is independent of the other features. Uh, then you get, uh, you typically get Poisson posterior distributions for your uh, statistics of interest. This will be also emphasized by Lorenzo because you are using a completely random measures. And finally, uh, all the statistics, uh, as I said, all the statistics involving the new features, the, um, the posterior distribution of all the statistics involving new features depend on the initial sample only to the sample size length. This is too simple, and we would like to enrich, to introduce a new class of prior distributions in order to enrich the predictive structure. So this is uh, the reason why we have introduced scale process trials. So uh, we now move to the case of scaled process priors for Bernoulli processes. So first of all, uh, we start with the definition of a scale process prior. What is a scale process prior? A scale process prior is, uh, is based on a transformation of a completely random measure. So first of all, you have to consider a completely random measure till they not, which is called, which I call a baseline completely random measure. And this completely random measure is characterized by a Levy intensity of the following form. Uh, and uh, here, the completely random measure can be represented in the following way, uh, where the jumps of the completely random measures are in between zero plus infinity, so they do not need to be in between zero and one. Now you consider these uh, jumps, and then you order the jumps of the completely random measures. So delta one, delta two are the ordered jumps of the completely random measure. And then we define this, uh, uh, this new random measure, which is, uh, as you can see, is the sum of, uh, so it's, uh, it's the following, it has the following discrete representation, and uh, uh, we have simply considered the previous uh, random measure, we have removed the largest jump, and then we have normalized, we have normalized the previous random measure by the largest jump, delta one. Delta one here is the largest jump. So as you can see here, you obtain a random measure whose jumps are in between zero and one, okay? Then I will, uh, uh, I will uh, denote by L the conditional distribution of the sequence of the renormalized jumps given the largest jump. So this L is simply the conditional distribution of this sequence conditional on the largest jump. Now, the definition of a scaled process prior 
follows by a suitable deformation of the distribution of the largest junk delta one. So roughly speaking, we can see, so roughly speaking, a scale process prior is something like that, where you deform the distribution of the largest jump delta one. So in other words, you change the distribution of the largest jump delta one with a new distribution, uh, and uh, you replace the distribution of delta one with, a new, uh, with the distribution of a new random variable called C1. This is the idea. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, definition, so this construction is very similar to the construction of poisson kingman models. I will come back on this later. Uh, this uh, definition has uh, first uh, been firstly given by Lancelot, Lancelot James and co-authors in, uh, in a paper. And uh, we have used, we have explored this definition in the context of feature sampling models and we have focused on a particular tractable case. Um, the formal definition of a scale process prior, to be more formal, the definition of a scale process prior is, uh, is the following one. So a scale process prior, it's a, a random measure like this, um, okay, where Wi, this uh, random, uh, this uh, sequence of atoms, so these atoms are IID from the distribution P. P, it's, uh, uh, so P appears in uh, the Levy intensity of the baseline completely random measure, okay? <clears throat> and uh, uh, then the, here you have the sequence of jumps, Proconai, and the sequence of jumps has distribution A, where L was the previous uh, conditional distribution. So the, this sequence of jumps has, has distribution L, and uh, here we have replaced the distribution of the largest jump with the distribution of C1, where C1 has its own density, which I call G. In order to denote the distribution of a scale process prior, I will use the following notation. So the scaled process prior is, uh, uh, depends on lambda and P, where lambda and P are uh, the so where lambda p appears in the Levy intensity measure of the baseline completely random measure, and g, g refers to the distribution of this new largest jump, C1. Okay, so, um, so I, if uh, there is any question, I am available to, to answer. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so, this, uh, so this definition is, uh, is crucial. And, uh, uh, what are, uh, so there are some important comments. So this definition is uh, uh, very similar to the definition of a poisson kingman model. And uh, uh, in order to obtain a tractable classes of prior, so you have to, uh, to choose the baseline completely random measure in a suitable way. Okay, now uh, we, uh, first of all, uh, before uh, focusing, so, uh, instead of focusing on, on speci specific choices of the baseline completely random measure, I first focus on uh, the predictive distribution for the general class of scale process prior. So uh, just to sum up, this is the statistical model we are dealing with. Uh, we are considering Bernoulli processes and uh, we assume uh, to work with a scale process prior. Again, uh, I assume to, uh, to observe a sample of size n and we assume to uh, that the sample displays k distinct features uh, with uh, respective counts m1 and k. Okay, and uh, we have characterized the predicted distribution in two steps. Uh, first of all, um, we have characterized the conditional distribution of the largest jumps c1 conditionally on the sample. And then we have characterized the distribution of the next individual given C1 and the initial sample. Uh, first of all, so the posterior distribution of uh, the posterior distribution of C1 is the following one. It's characterized by um, it's characterized by <coughs> the following uh, uh, the following density function. As you can see, the, the posterior distribution of C1 depends on the initial sample to the whole sampling information. So the frequency counts, the number of distinct features, and so on. And then we have characterized the posterior distribution of the next individual given the past and given the observed sample and C1. As you can see, the posterior distribution of the next individual is characterized again by two distinct terms. 
this part in blue, which refers to the new features that will be selected, and this part in green, which refers to the already observed features, okay? Uh, so, uh, as you can see, this part in blue, this part in blue is again a Bernoulli process uh, whose parameter is a completely random measure. And the Levy intensity of this completely random measure is the following one. The following Levy intensity depends on the initial sample, only to the sample size n, but it also depends on C1. And C1, by the fact that this uh, uh, intensity depends on C1, we have enriched the predictive structure of the previous statistical model. So indeed, the distribution of C1 depends on the initial sample to the whole sampling information. So the introduction of this random variable C1 has the ability to enrich uh, the predictive rule of the statistical model by including additional sampling information. And you can control the sampling information that you have in, the, in your model. Okay? So, uh, and then uh, you have this uh, part in green, uh, which refers to the part uh, which refers to the already observed features in the initial sample. Okay. So uh, what about uh, so uh, what about if you uh, so we have described the posterior distribution in general, but now we would like to focus on a suitable tractable class of scaled process primers. In particular, uh, if the baseline completely random measure is a sigma stable completely random measure, then we get a stable scaled process prior. What does it mean? So the, the sigma stable completely random measure is nothing but a completely random measure characterized by the following level intensity. Okay. In addition, if you select a stable completely random measure, and if in addition the uh, distribution of C1 is a polynomial exponential tilting of the original largest jump delta 1, then you get a stable beta scale process prior. So if you select a stable completely random measure, and if C1 is a polynomial exponential tilting of the original largest jump, then you get this class of stable beta scale process prior. The stable beta scale process prior is a very useful choice because this is a tractable model. And uh, uh, it's not difficult to show that in, in this case, the posterior distribution of C1 to the power minus sigma is a gamma with the parameters C plus one and beta, where C and beta are the parameters of the polynomial exponential tilting. It's also, uh, it's also interesting to underline that the beta, the beta process may be recovered as a limiting case. And uh, as I said, you get analytical tractability uh, to, to face posterior inference. Uh, indeed, if, you, if we assume to work with uh, our tool, so if uh, your data are Bernoulli processes, and if you select a stable beta scale process prior as a prior distribution in your statistical model, then it's possible to, uh, to, to show that the predictive distribution it's possible to characterize the predictive distribution in a very simple way. So we assume again to, uh, that Z1, Zn is our sample, and we assume to observe k distinct features out of the sample with the counts M1 and k. It's not difficult to show that the posterior distribution of C1 to the power minus sigma is a gamma with the following parameters. And as you can see, the, post the, the posterior distribution of this uh, um, variable depends on the initial sample only through the sam um, only through uh, the, the, the sample size n and the number of distinct features. So, so we have enriched the, the predictive structure with respect to the to the case of completely random measures. On the other side, we can characterize the distribution of the next individual given the data and C1 as follows. And as you can see, the posterior distribution is the sum of two components, a part in blue, which refers to the number of new features, of the, uh, which refers to the number of new genetic variants, and a part in green, which refers to the, to the, number, uh, to the number of already observed features. 
So this part in blue is again a Bernoulli process whose parameter is a completely random measure with the following Levy intensity. And as you can see, the Levy intensity of this completely random measure depends on the initial sample, on which the sample size n, but it also depends on C1 to the power minus sigma. And as you can see, the, as you can see from the previous slide, the distribution of C1 to the power minus sigma depends on the initial sample to the sample size and the, uh, and the number of distinct features. So uh, the use of this, uh, uh, this new uh, class of processes uh, has, uh, uh, has the advantage to enrich the predictive structure with respect to the case of, uh, the case of completely random measures. And in particular, the predictive distribution of the number of new features, so the, the posterior distribution for statistics involving new features, depend on the initial sample, only to the sample size n, and the number of distinct features. So this is very, very important. Uh, besides, you can also, so, uh, also, so we have characteristics Characterize the uh, predictive distribution, but it's also possible to characterize, for example, the marginal distribution. What does it mean? Uh, so it's, it's possible, roughly speaking, to, to determine the probability uh, to observe k distinct features out of the initial sample with respective frequencies m1 and k. Uh, and uh, we have shown that uh, the, the marginal distribution of the, this model is the following one. Uh, so it's very easy, it's very simple to deal with, uh, and uh, this uh, marginal distribution in the literature is also known as the exchangeable feature allocation probability function. Uh, in order to conclude my part of uh, the talk, the first part of the talk, I would, uh, I would discuss some characterizations of scale process priors in terms of the predictive structure. So why this uh, class of stable scale process prior is important? Uh, do stable scale process prior exhibit any peculiar uh, feature? The answer is yes, and uh, is, uh, is provided by the following theorem. So uh, assume to deal with uh, Bernoulli processes and uh, suppose that your prior distribution for the parameter is a scale process prior. We have shown that the posterior distribution of C1, so C1 is the, uh, the new largest jump, say, so uh, the posterior distribution of C1 depends on the initial sample only through the sample size n and the number of distinct features if and only if the baseline completely random measure is a stable completely random measure. So this is a nice characterization theorem and this is the reason why this class of stable scale process prior is important in the context of scaled process priors. Uh, <clears throat> Then I would like to discuss uh, some connections. So I would like to discuss the connection of scale process priors and uh, Poisson Kingman models in terms of the predictive structure. Uh, just to remind the definition of Poisson Kingman models, Poisson Kingman models are uh, very popular in a species sampling model. Uh, uh, within the species sampling setting, and uh, custom Kingman models arise uh, as uh, suitable transformations of uh, completely random measures. So typically you consider a completely random measure in the context of species, and then uh, we denote by T the total mass of this completely random measure. Uh, in the style of Ragazzini and Otto, so you can define a uh, normalized random measures by considering uh, the completely random measure and then you normalize the completely random measure by the total mass of it. Then you get uh, a random probability measure. Uh, the, the definition, so a Poisson Kingman model, arises by a suitable deformation of the distribution of this total mass of it. Uh, so, um, Poisson King, the definition of a Poisson Kingman model is very similar to the definition of a, a scale process prior. What is the difference? In uh, the case of Poisson Kingman model, uh, we deform the distribution T, while in the case of uh, a scale process prior, we deform the distribution of the largest jump. This is the difference. 
So, uh, in there, so <clears throat> there is this analogy between Poisson Kingman models and uh, scale process priors, but uh, the, the, the question is, uh, is there an analogy between uh, scale process prior and Poisson Kingman models in terms, in terms of predictive structure? Is there, is there any analogy between specific uh, priors within these classes? And the answer is yes. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, predictive uh, structure, Poisson Kingman mode, this, uh, uh, this proportion holds true in terms of predictive structure. So Poisson Kingman models are to scale process priors exactly as the Dirichlet process is to the data process. What does it mean? <clears throat> it means that the Dirichlet process is the sole species and the model for which the probability of observing a new species depends on the initial sample only through the sample size. This result is due to Regazzini. And the beta process is the sole scale process prior for which statistics involving new features depend on the initial sample only through the sample size. Then there is this analogy between the, between the Dirichlet process and the beta process. Uh, this uh, characterization of the data process holds through in the class of scale process priors. So an open problem is the following one. Does a similar characterization hold in a, a broader class than the class of scale process priors? So this is an open problem. <laughs> then uh, you have also the following uh, proportion in terms of predictive structures. Poisson Kingman models are to scale process priors exactly as the pit major process is the stable beta scale the process prior. What does it mean? <clears throat> so the pit major process is the sole species sampling model for which the probability of observing a new species depends on the initial sample, only to the sample size n and the number of distinct species. This result can be found in Isabel. On the other side, side, the stable beta scale process prior we have introduced is the sole scale process prior for which statistics involving new features depend on the initial sample only to the sample size then and the number of distinct, uh, of distinct features. So uh, this uh, stable scale process prior can be, uh, can be seen as uh, the pit major process in the context of the, in the feature sampling setting. Okay, so <clears throat> this uh, stable scale process prior behaves uh, like the pit major process, but in the context of a feature sampling model. So, and uh, this uh, analogy is also corroborated in terms of asymptotic results that we have uh, that uh, have no time uh, to show. So uh, the, the characterization theorem for uh, the stable scale, uh, the characterization theorem for the stable bet, uh, beta scale process prior holds true in the context of scaled process prior, also within the class of scale process prior. The open problem is the following one. So the open problem is uh, the following. Does similar characterization hold in a, a more general context than uh, the context of scaled process priors? So this is an open question. Just to, to wrap up and to introduce uh, the, uh, the talk by Lorenzo, uh, so scale process priors uh, we have uh, analyzed, uh, uh, they, they are very useful because they allow to include additional sampling information in the predictive structure. Uh, all the posterior representations are simple and you get interpretability of all uh, the results, uh, of all the parameters and so on. And uh, the results are also elegant from a mathematical viewpoint. <clears throat> so there are some open questions that uh, uh, that Lorenzo is going to address. First of all, uh, is it simple to face and set prediction in this framework? So given an initial sample, is it simple to predict the outcome of a future sample of arbitrary size? Uh, what about, uh, um, so how do uh, stable state process priors perform in application? What is the advantage of uh, this class of prior with a uh, what is the advantage of the stable beta scale process prior with respect to the three parameter beta process? Is there any, uh, any useful uh, 
Finally, is there use? Is it useful to use a stable state process prior with respect to the, to the three parameter data process in real applications? So, and these questions uh, will be addressed uh, in, in the talk by uh, Lorenzo. Um, so, I have finished uh, my, my part of the talk. I can then take over. I think you might have to stop the screen share. Oops. Okay, hopefully you can all now see my screen. Uh, I'll take that as a yes. Uh, I should be sharing my presentation. Cool, awesome. Okay, so just very quickly to uh, recap where, where we're at. Uh, I'm just going to basically try to present a few experimental results that uh, justify, I guess, what uh, Federico has been discussing through this uh, methodological uh, you know, advances. <clears throat> and. This is a slide Federico basically already presented, but since we've talked a lot about math before in the last like 30 minutes, I figured it would be good to just refresh our memories a little bit. So the setting we're considering is basically the biological one in which we, uh, we are observing individual genomic sequences uh, that are composed of bases that are nucleotides, and we have fixed positions on the sequences. And uh, the fundamental idea is that uh, these positions or alleles can differ from individual to individual. So we have a uh, like a reference genome that is an idealized sequence, and we have a bunch of individual sequences, and we do, do observe discrepancies between this reference and this uh, reference. So in this stylized example, for example, uh, you know, we have an individual up, a row up here, and we have a reference down here, and we can encode the difference between the reference and the and every individual by means of a, of a binary variable. So for example, for the first locus, these two things uh, agree. For the second locus, these two things agree. But for the third locus, for example, these things disagree. And we can perform, enumerate these discrepancies for every individual across all, 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 the, ref, all, all, the, all the genome by making this comparison, pairwise comparison to the, to the reference. Um, and so uh, the key idea here is that uh, biologists are really interested in these variants, that is, these differences that arise between individual sequences uh, and, and uh, reference genome. So in particular, given our data, we can create these simplified summary statistic by looking at the variants that, that are produced. And we say that a variance is called whenever the allele uh, of an individual differs from the standard reference that is an input to the problem it's given. Um, and pictorially, I guess we can encode this by means of a, of a, of a, like a, a binary vector in which black squares here represents uh, the arisal of variance. So the idea is that like, if we want to uh, make an analysis about the arisal of variance, uh, we can basically perform this binary comparison for uh, every sample we have and we can uh, organize this data in a binary matrix in which in the rows we'll, ha we'll have the samples, every row corresponds to a patient, and in the columns we'll have the genomic loci. So every genomic locus uh, will correspond to a column, and whenever we observe variation at a given genomic locus, we'll have a, a black square, and this will be a very sparse matrix because like, in order for life to be, uh, in order for an individual to be alive, we need to have a lot of structure in the genome, but there will also be a lot of variation because we do observe a lot of genomic variation. And then the question is, how can we use the tools we discussed in order to make prediction about the number of new variants that we're going to observe. Uh, and so the assumption that we make is basically uh, to uh, assume exchangeability and consequently, I guess, assume uh, fundamentally uh, s s some form, form of like uh, exchangeability across the loci as well. So we assume basically a left order form. We sort the columns that is the loci by, or by order of appearance. We destroy a lot of the spatial structure, which we know does matters for biology, but this is helpful for, for the prediction task. This is exactly the problem that we'll try to, to tackle, that is predicting the number of new variants to be observed in new samples. And so just by joining the dots, the idea is that we'll have a model, a Bayesian parametric model for the arisal of, of this binary matrix. And then we'll try to use the predictive laws of this model um, in order to address exactly this question. That is to say, if we were to enlarge this, this, this matrix by adding, adding rows, how many new variants, that is how many new features from this Bayesian model uh, would be activated? Um, and um, yeah, just to wrap up visually what we've discussed, I guess the old framework that uh, people typically thought about was that of completely random measures. And so the way it worked there is that we imagined the space of, of, of variants 
uh, is kind of like, uh, you know, like an abstract space that I'm here knowing by omega uh, and uh, pair these variants the space of variance with corresponding rates that is non-negative values. Uh, and like in this context, a variant is really represented by a location, like which could just be an index for our purposes, uh, paired with a rate that you can think of as the probability of the variant appearing in the population. And we do so uh, for basically infinitely many variants. We, we, we characterize the distribution with which these variants uh, appear. And we do so through the, uh, the language of Poisson point processes. This, gets, uh, this leads to a completely random measure. Um, and we are a little clever in doing so. We basically choose a law for the, the completely random measure such that the support of the rates is bounded above uh, by one and below by zero. And in that case, the rate can immediately be thought of as a variance probability. Um, and so to connect this discussion to what we, we, we've seen before, then we can imagine drawing basically a Bernoulli point process uh, conditionally on, on this completely random measure in which basically for every of these infinitely many atoms, we draw a binary variable with the probability given by the corresponding uh, rate of, of the variant. And this leads to uh, 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 an infinite binary vector that under uh, pretty standard conditions as almost surely finite sum. That is to say, uh, for any individual, we'll observe finitely many variants, which is consistent with what we observe in reality, because in reality, we only have finitely many positions even on the genome. Um, and relying on this Poisson point process uh, language, uh, the limitation is that the variant probability arises of every probability uh, of every variant arises independently of the others. And so a consequence that Federica has hinted at is that whenever you choose a, we choose a uh, complete random measure prior, and we pair it with a Bernoulli point process of, as I've described here, uh, then the, the predictive law will be a Poisson distribution, and you cannot escape that. And the reason is that you are in this complete random measure world, so Poisson point processes. And importantly, the parameter of this Poisson will depend on the observed sample only, uh, only through the sample size. And all the sample information will be captured by some hyperparameter nu, uh, that it's typically a hyperparameter of the of the process. And so the difference with what we propose here, this scale random measures framework, is that by doing this normalization, Federico hinted at that I'm not going to get into details here, but it's basically a scaling, we're able to induce some form of dependence. And this is important for the prediction task because when we go and look at the predictive structure uh, that we induce, so the same problem as before, how many new variants are going to uh, be observed if we were to enlarge this sample by adding new columns to that binary matrix? And we see that, first of all, we're not uh, constrained anymore to having a Poisson posterior predictive. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we proved that for the choice we have, we, we, can have uh, we do have a negative binomial law. And importantly, the parameters of this negative binomial uh, depend on observed sample uh, that is, on what we've already collected by more than just the sample size. And in the case we choose, uh, we show that it depends explicitly on the number of distinct variants that we've already observed. So this would be the number of columns in that binary matrix that I was showing before, K sub n. Um, and I would like to emphasize that this is kind of like a, a sweet, sweet spot between additional complexity and, and uh, analytical tractability. Uh, but there might be other choices that lead to uh, to even a richer uh, dependence on the observed sample. And so now the, the question that we, we were kind of interested in is, okay, like uh, we've, we, we have this different structure and this additional structure and this, this additional information, can we leverage this in our prediction task? If we're really interested in predicting how many uh, new variants we're going to observe, will that lead to better predictive distribution? So uh, uh, I'll, 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 I'll get to that in a second. I just want to also mention that uh, an important feature of these models is that, is that also the prediction for uh, rare variants, so variants that appear with a given frequency, um, is, is characterizable and it's analytically uh, easy to, to characterize. Um, um, so um, yeah, I'll skip this part and jump right, right into the into the experiments. So the experimental setting we're considering here is that we have some cancer data. Uh, uh, in which we have a bunch of patients that we are here uh, plotting on the x-axis, and we're counting the number of distinct variants. And counting the variants is important because it can basically uh, really inform the way in which we think of like designing experiment and designing drugs uh, and like de developing treatment for for uh, things like cancer. 
And so here, uh, like we imagine that we've only collected, for example, 10 samples, so very few samples, maybe because it's a really uh, rare cancer. And we see that in these 10 samples after, uh, you know, after, after 10 samples, we have something like maybe uh, 50 variants in, in, these, in, in these samples. And now we're interested in asking ourselves, what if we were to collect 50 samples now, uh, 50 samples now uh, like 40 additional samples? And this is what we would observe. Like I can compute this quantity because I actually had more than, than 10 samples in my data, but uh, in a real experiment, like maybe I don't, and I might be interested in understanding if, for example, that data is valuable. Am I going to observe more new variants, for example, are, and because new variants might inform the, uh, you know, practitioners about like this disease. And so the exercise we do here is that we compare different prediction methods that are out there in the literature for this task. For example, this is a good tool in estimator. In this case, we see that it really does not perform well. So the way I form this is I just feed in this data and I try to extrapolate up to 50. Um, there are alternatives that work well. For example, this jackknife estimator, a linear programming estimator. This is a, a Bayesian nonparametric estimator based on the IBP prior. And this is what I we were just talking about, the stable scale process prior. So we see that in this case, like for example, uh, the stable scale process does a little better than, than the other ones, but it's not dramatically better. And so where we really see a benefit from using this methods versus the other ones is if now from very few samples, we try to extrapolate many steps in advance, say, like forward. Say that, that we start from 10 and we go want to go up to 100. Uh, in this case, we do see that the, the performance of the scalable still process starts being uh, significantly better than the other ones. And if we go up to 300, for example, this, uh, this is e even better. And the intuition here is that by, uh, especially when the sample size is small, basically, Something like the IBP, for example, three beta process prior, which is the other Bayesian nonparametric competitor, um, needs to really rely on the estimation of the hyperparameters of the process in order to perform prediction. And when you have little data, that might be hard uh, to learn these parameters. And somehow, by including in the posterior predictive additional sample information, you make also the estimation task a little simpler and the, the method more stable. Um, and so, this is really the setting in which we've seen this method excel and, and perform well. Uh, and this is general, general it's, it's true more broadly in these data sets we've looked at. This is again, cancer data. Uh, and again, these are examples in which we only retain 10% of data, uh, sorry, 10 data points and extrapolate up to very large sample sizes. And again, this, the reason why we care about this in application is because in practice, in many cases for these rare cancers, for example, it is the case that collecting data is hard and is expensive and we have to work with these small cohorts. And so this prediction task really needs to be uh, effective when the sample sizes are small. Um, and I don't have a, a lot of time to discuss, I guess I'm basically out of time, uh, other, uh, other settings. But another thing I would like to point out is that uh, these rich Bayesian and parametric models are also interesting and, and I think useful for other applications. For example, one thing we've looked at is experimental design, like having this uh, rich Bayesian model can inform, for example, uh, things like how should we go and collect data? How should we sequence data? And one thing we've done, for example, is like enrich this Bayesian model we're talking about and mm, introduce things like uh, sequencing depth and like using these predictions in order to inform how we should design experiments. Um, and I don't have time to get into this. I, 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 I kind of run out of time, so I'll just wrap up with some conclusions by saying that Basically, this line of work, what we do is really to develop this uh, new Bayesian parametric framework and apply this to prediction in genomic studies. And so the problems we look at today, we mostly talked about prediction of the number of new genomic variants discovered. This follows naturally from the predictive laws of these BNP models. Uh, but more broadly, I think these models are interesting and powerful because they can help informing experimental design more broadly. So for example, they can help us uh, maximizing the number of discoveries uh, if we were to enlarge this matrix by informing us of how we should collect data. Um, and uh, just to wrap up, where we, you can find discussion of this work, uh, there is a first paper that came out in, in, in Biometrica uh, that mostly looks at the predictive laws of the uh, IBP and like how to enrich this model in, or, in order to make this experimental design consideration I was hinting at. And then there's a follow-up paper that, uh, that it's up on the archive in case you're interested, which talks about this other uh, work. And I've not discussed it, this today, but I just want to mention that 
this framework we talked about is really also useful, I think, for other ideas that are application, other applications, such as, for example, optimizing sequencing depth when you're interested in power trade-offs in rare variance association studies, uh, really leveraging this Bayesian, Bayesian model. And there is another uh, work that is actually now up on the archive. I've not included the link here, but if you're interested, uh, I, I, I can send you the link. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I guess I'm out of time. Uh, sorry for running a little late, but uh, in case anyone uh, has questions or, or follow up comments, uh, very happy to, to take them. Okay, well, first of all, let's thank Federico and Lorenzo for this a great presentation. So I wanna clap on behalf of everybody. And uh, well, now we have time for maybe for a couple of questions, a couple of minutes. If anybody has a question, please, uh, turn on your, your mic and go ahead. You can also use the chat or you can also use the right hand tool in, in Zoom. Let me see. Maybe, maybe I can ask you a quick question. So, uh, Federico, in your presentation, at some point you, you mentioned that you, you this baseline measure mu mu tilde zero you use a yeah. sigma stable completely random measure right and that lead to a, a model at the end that is you need to specify the sigma the c and the beta so i'm wondering if, if in the in the applications that lorenzo presented is using the same like basically the same base measure and if so how can you choose this three parameters or how sensitive are the inferences to the choice to these three quantities? Yes, we choose the, the, the same. Uh, so we specified the stable beta scale process prior and uh, we tried with different choices uh, for uh, the parameters, but I think uh, we, we applied, if uh, I'm not wrong, the, the method of moments uh, at the end, uh, something like that. Yes, I mean, like for the computation, I guess, like the crucial thing uh, is that we we learn, we, 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 we don't fix the parameters. The parameters are learned from the data. So there's several ways in which you could learn them. Like a natural choice, I guess, would be to use uh, something like maximum likelihood, uh, for example, by looking at the, 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 the marginal distribution of the, of the binary matrix that we we're talking about. So something like the uh, EFPF, for example. Uh, it's just the generation of, generalization of the, uh, ex exchangeable probability uh, partition function. Um, we've also looked at other ways of learning these parameters, for, exa for example, via regression. So really looking directly uh, at, the, at the predictives. Um, and dif these different choices are, are discussed in, in uh, especially in the first paper I was mentioning, um, the, the, the paper that appeared on Biometrica. Um, and uh, yeah, the prediction is crucially driven by these different parameters. So uh, there would be no way for us to fix those parameters. It's really important for us to, to learn those parameters from the data. And that's a crucial step. Okay, well, thank you. Let me see if anybody has a question. I don't see any. So I think that uh, we can thank again our speakers for this great presentation and well, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.